Okay. I'm learning new stuff about this. I'm learning new stuff about Matthew's camera. Da 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 da. Um, this is Jeremy from Phantom Studios, and I'm here to present to you a special um, video. It is, I won't necessarily call it a documentary, but this video is going to be called The Top 10 Tanks of All Time, uh, listing 10 of the greatest tanks that uh, was ever that were ever used and their impact on the history of tanks and world history. Uh, we're going to start with number 10, the M4 Sherman. The M4 Sherman entered service in 1941 in the early years of World War II, based on the design of the M3 Lee slash Grant. At the time, the Sherman was an even opponent for the Panzer, for the Panzers 3 and 4, However, when the Panther and the Tiger entered service, the Sherman was out-armored and outgunned. However, there was one thing that kept the Sherman alive. It was the ability to mass-produce the Sherman. So overall, the Sherman itself was not a totally, totally reliable tank, but there sure were a large amount of these vehicles produced. In fact, by the end of World War II, there was an estimated amount of 50,000 Shermans produced, including Sherman variants such as the Aunt Gemini, the Easy 8, and the Duplex Drive Sherman. The pros of the Sherman were easy to drive, roomy interior, fast, and good cro cross country performance. The cons of the Sherman were thin armor for a medium tank. Ammo, ammo on the sides of the tank, and gasoline powered, meaning it burned when hit. And so I want to combine those three cons into one. You basically have thin armor, so it's easy to penetrate. The ammo racks are on the side of the tank, and so if that gets hit, it goes up in an explosion. And being gasoline powered, you know that gasoline it burns easily when when uh, treated to heat, uh, those three do not mix well. And so basically, the Allies called it, I forgot what it was, it was like a Thompson lighter or something like that, and the Germans called it a Tommy cooker. It earned those nicknames for it was easy to penetrate and it just burned whenever it was hit. But there sure were a lot of them, so they could definitely overwhelm the enemy, because the Tigers and Panthers were heavier and not as easy to make. And also, uh, once I am done discussing about these tanks, I will uh, do on a scale of 1 to 20 certain the stats of armor, armament, mobility, mass production, and fear factor. So the Sherman, on a scale of 1 to 20, the armor ranks in a 7.5, armament which if if you don't know what armament means it's basically it's firepower armament ranks in a 6 mobility 11 mass production 18 and fear factor 4 okay real quick before i go into number 9 it was not a thompson lighter or whatever i said it what the allies called it, it was not a thompson lighter it was a romson lighter is what they called it i just couldn't remember it but enough about correcting myself, for I have to do that a lot. Number nine was the Israeli Merkava. Now, this is a quote from a TV show that my older brother loves to watch. It is, This tank doesn't grow out of the drawing board. It grows out of armored warfare. And the one problem in armored warfare is that a good tank, no, is that a good tank crew is worth more than a good tank. And yeah, it's true. The Merkava was a modified w version 
of the British Centurion, and the main changes were a different turret, engine in the front of the crew compartment to block shots to the crew compartment, and open space with an escape hatch for, for the crew and tank grenadiers at the back of the tank. The tank was produced in Israel and entered service in 1982 against Syran forces in Lib Liberon, I think. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. L-E-B-A-N-O-N. -E but... On a scale of 1 to 10, the Merkava's armor is classified. I, If it's classified, I can't really give any much on its armor, but I did know that it was very hard to even penetrate its armor to get to the engine. The armament was... The armament is a 12, mobility 6.75, mass production 5, and fear factor 15. Uh, this thing, it it was very hard. You could knock out the tank, but it was harder to kill the crew. This uh, the Merkava earned the nickname the safest tank in the world, and it is true because Israel cares more about their tank care not their tanks cares more about their men than their tanks. Once again, having to correct myself before I go into number eight. When I was ris when I was listing the scales on the Merkiva, I said on a scale of one to ten instead of one to twenty. Once again, I'm very sorry. I'm not camera shy. It's just I can stutter a lot when presenting something. It's not that I'm shy or anything. It's just something I can sometimes end up reading something wrong. But let's hope I don't have to correct myself again. Number 8 is the T-54-55, or you could just call it the T-54-55, it doesn't matter. The T-54-55 was the Russian version of the Sherman. However, most people considered it far better than the Sherman, having a larger gun, thicker armor, and even faster than the Sherman. Better. And just like the Sherman, it was easy to mass produce. Russia would continue to produce the T-54-55 until the 1990s. That's that's quite a while. So just like the Sherman, it wasn't how good the tank was. It was how many there were. Once the T-54-55 was taken out of service, there were net there was an estimated amount of 60,000 produced. That's 10,000 more than the Sherman. It entered service in 1948, late for World War II, but just in time for the Cold War. And the tank truly was a great... The tank truly was a great tank. I mean, taking factors of the Sherman, like, easy to mass produce, fast, adding even more to it, and it was used for a long time. I mean, there are still modified versions. I mean, the tank is so good, the Egyptians still use it today, their own version. I can't remember its name. It's like... R2. No. The, it started with an R, and then it had a 2 at the end. I don't know what it was, but... It was definitely a great tank, and very reliable. I have to say, it was even better than... Uh, the next tank, the T-62, which had the first ta smoothbore tank gun, which it's not that accurate, and it was just a failed experiment. But, uh, never mind. Let's get to the ratings. On a scale of 1 to 20, armor ranks in at 9, armament 10, mobility 13, mass production 19, and Fear Factor 6. It was definitely... There were definitely a lot of them. It could be knocked out very easily, but it was still to be feared for there were a lot of them. But... Uh, 
there's something. Oh yes, the Sherman actually. Uh, the last few variants, like the Easy Eight, was probably the best variant, and they stopped using. And that thing was used up until like uh, the Cold War with Israel, and, and uh, used up. Uh, it was only used up until the like the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and maybe the Cold War, but it was never really used that far up, and. This, the T-5455, was used up until the 1990s, which, that's crazy, but it's pretty incredible that even though they're basically the same thing, just some a little bit of thicker armor, a slightly larger gun, and slightly faster, I mean, it's only like a mile an hour faster, it still served for much longer, because the Russian engineers, they really knew how to do this kind of stuff. So that's the T-5455. Yay, didn't have to correct myself. Mm, let's move on to number seven. Uh, number seven is the Challenger 2. The Challenger 2 entered service in 1994 and is the main battle tank for the British Army today. It was a new and improved version of the Challenger 1, which was based on the Chieftain which was based on the Centurion, which was based on the British cruiser tanks of World War II, which was based on the Vickers six-ton tank, which shared similarities with the A1E1 Independent, which was the first British tank to have a turret based on the Renault FT-17, which got inspiration from the early armored cars of French design. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, it makes me laugh that I end up writing that on this script. So you can see it goes back quite some ways. But enough with Origins, the Challenger 2 had more advanced weapon systems compared to the Challenger 1, and the Battlefield Information Control System, or BICS, was added for greater combat capability. I... there was actually not much to say about the Challenger 2 compared to the Challenger 1, and that's what I was doing here. It's not much to say, so what I added was its origin story all the way back to the dawn of AFVs with the armor, with the early armored cars. Um, hey, at least I didn't go as far back as, like, the first armored car to be approved by military. The Aust uh, I don't, uh, please, this is an Austrian name, so please do not Get mad. Austra. Austra. De Lammer. Armored car. Hopefully I pronounced that right. But, anyway, uh, it did have better weapon systems, and that was pretty much it. But it definitely was better than the Challenger 1, and the British use it today, and it is, pr and it is a great tank in the hands of the British. And. It definitely does go back quite a ways. I mean, I doubt I, if you're a tank fanatic, you probably heard of like all those uh, minus like the Ford, no, like the Vickers six-ton tank, which was literally it was not real. It was a tank that wasn't really used in service, but it was a tank that wasn't really used in service, but. It was a basis tank. Basically, many tanks were made off of it, such as the T-26 for the Russians, and uh, the British cruiser tanks of World War II, uh, the, the Vickers six-ton tank, a lot of different tanks were based off of it. Um, enough with that, on a scale of 1 to 20, the armor is, once again, like the Merkava, classified, because it is their tank that they use now. The armament is 15, mobility 11, mass production 5, and fear factor 7. Fear factor is kind of low because it's basically the same thing as the Challenger, the Challenger 1, but with some upgraded systems. And so it wasn't that much to really be feared, but it is a good tank. And that's why armament and mobility are pretty high, because nowadays you can have like heavy armor and firepower on a fast tank. I mean, the Abrams shows that. But, that's all I have to say about the Challenger 2.
Okay, now we're going to look at number six. Number six, it's a mouthful, but I can pronounce this properly. The Panzer Kampfwagen 4, otherwise known as the Panzer 4. And number six, the Panzer IV was feared when first put into service. Entering service in 1942, in the middle of World War II, it was a groundbreaking tank for its time. The first tank to have a radio installed in it. It became... Uh, it was the first tank to have a radio installed in it. Sorry. Proper grammar there. <laughs> that, well, that was improper. Um... It became hard to beat. It became a hard tank to beat until the arrival of the Sherman the following year. Later, later versions included the Oschef II with a larger gun, the Oschef H with anti-explosive armor, the Oschef J command tank, and... Please, if you're a German, please just don't get... Please don't get mad at me for pronouncing this wrong. I mean, it's a really long name, and it's crazy. Strunges Kachsner Arts mit 7.5 cm PAK 1 slash 45 off Fargest L Panzer Kapwagen 4 Tank Destroyer. I told you! I was crazy. But, but if that's too much for you, <coughs> but if that's too much for you, then just call it the Jag, the Jagged Panzer IV. I really like its short name a lot better. <laughs> but basically, it was a tank destroyer version of the Panzer IV. It was a very late variant to come along, and it was meant to replace their current tank destroyer, the Elephant Tank Destroyer. Which the it was a good tank destroyer. It could knock out actually knock out uh, a T thirty four from about three miles away, which was unheard of at the time. The main problem with that tank destroyer is the engine was awful, and literally the funniest part of the story. I forgot what battle it was, but at this one battle, they were going up a hill, and all of a sudden, they exploded and burst in the flames, and it was figured out that these things, if you tried to go uphill with them, they would explode. Their engines couldn't take it. It's worse than, it was worse than the gear system on the, <laughs> it was worse than the gear system on the Panther. <laughs> um, the Panzer IV was a great tank until... The arrival of the Sherman, but then they released the Tiger and the Panther and the King Tiger. And uh, I was a uh, far better, and those things were far better, better matches for the sh better at matching up against the Sherman and taking them out. But, uh, yeah. That's, uh, let's go to the scales. On a scale of 1 to 20, making sure I get that right. Armor is a 6.5, armament 6, mobility 10, mass production 10, and fear factor 16. It was definitely something to be feared, and it was pretty okay to easy to mass produce halfway there. Also, mobility was good, armament. It, it was okay, because it was actually, the, the barrel looked pretty short. The first few variants, the barrel looked very short, but it was actually a very powerful gun. And the Oschgif 2 just added to that. And there was also like, I forgot what it was. It was like this version with a super high millimeter gun. It was like short barrel, but it was like high millimeter. It was crazy. And it was definitely something to be feared of. Because uh, uh, it was a tough... Not to crack until the sherbet. And so, uh, that was the Panzer IV at number six. Okay. Not really much I could say before I go into number five, so let's get right into it. Number five is the British Centurion. 
The Centurion was the last cruiser tank that the British ever made. Though late for World War II, it was just in time for Israel to use it against their neighboring enemies. In the hands of the British, it was great. In the hands of Israel, it was amazing. It was a good tank. Uh, not just Israel used it. Sweden began to produce their own Centurion Mark IIs in the late 1950s. Israel used it to build the Merkiva, which is number 9 on this list. Just in case you forgot. Short-term memory loss. Um, long after the Centurion went out of service, it would still be used for many other tasks, such as armor an armor recovery vehicle, an amphibious recovery vehicle, a bridge layer, and an AVRE. The AVRE stands for something I just can't remember. But so on a scale of one to twenty, armor ranks in as sixteen. Armament 12, Mobility 13, Mass Production 7, and Fear Factor 14. This was the best cruiser tank British ever made. If you don't know what a cruiser tank is, I'll give you a brief definition that cruiser tank was a British attempt that started in the late night that started in the late 1930s. Um, and went on all the way through World War II. Uh, and what the cruiser tank was supposedly meant to be was a tank that combined thick armor that was hard, thick armor with fire with heavy firepower, plus um, ver plus being decently fast. And many attempts, there would always be one thing that didn't add up, add up like the first one. Um, the A nine. Cruiser Tank Mark I, uh, the first cruiser tank to see action. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I am confusing myself. But the A9 Cruiser Tank Mark I had good firepower and was fast, but didn't have good armor. The uh. The A, the A10 Cruiser Tank Mark IIA, uh, it had good firepower and thick armor, but it was not fast. And many other things would come, and eventually they perfected. The best cruiser tank to actually see action in World War II was the Comet. But that is not on this, but the Comet, I'll tell you, is not on this list, because the Centurion was way better, though it it could have proved its worth in World War II, but World War II ended by the time it came out in 1940, by the time it entered service in 1945. So, uh, yeah. That's uh, number five, the British Centurion. <sighs> okay, we're getting close to the end. We just finished discussing number five, which was the Centurion. Now we are going to take a look at number four which is the mark IV heavy tank now first glance at this you would think what the heck were they thinking well i just want to say this is the only tank world war one tank that is on this list the most of the tanks on this list are from like world war two cold war and modern era stuff like that um, the Mark IV heavy tank was one of the first tanks to see action ever. <laughs> the Mark IV was based on the Mark III, based on the Mark II, based on the Mark I. Pretty straightforward. Not much else. Because they weren't very creative with names, they were just... <clears throat> um... When the Mark I hit the scene, it was so feared by the Germans that the cry went up from the trenches, THE DEVIL IS COMING! They literally said that because they had no idea what this thing was. It was a giant bo metal box with guns sticking out of it coming towards them. And you know what's even scarier? 
some of these Germans had not even seen a car. And so they would pretty much be frightened by a tank. <laughs> now, if you are into the history of tanks like me, then you would know that the Mark V was a better tank. Then why is the Mark IV on this list and the Mark V isn't? Because the Mark V is not in 3, 2, or 1. Those are... Because the Mark V was going to be on this list, it would be right here at the number 4 spot. Maybe somewhere else. Uh, well, though the Mark V was a better tank, the Mark IV was more widely used. The tank itself, though was a disaster. Um, gonna go back real quick. The tank, the Mark IV was more widely used than the Mark V and uh, it, it was a very great tank even though the Mark V was better and probably the best they ever had in World War I. It just didn't uh, serve for that long. Oops, sorry. I have the tendency to play with stuff when I'm just talking. Uh, that was a fake ant, if you're wondering, because... Okay, off topic. <laughs> the tank itself, though, was a disaster, with many problems causing it to break down many times. Because these things, they, they get stuck in ditches and break down all the time. Um, but still, the Mark IV and V were so good, they continued to be used up until the 1930s with Canada. In 1918, however, now we're going to discuss about another tank that had a big impact on this tank. However, <coughs> in 1918, however, the Germans made their own tank, the Strompanzewagen ASMV. It's one of the best German tanks that I can pronounce. Um... But it was too late. The tank only served in in one battle. The Battle of villers Bertonics. I hope I pronounced that right. B-R-E-T-O-N-N-E-U-X. It's a French name, so... Uh, on April 24th, 1918. This would be the first tank-on-tank -tank battle in history, with the British coming out on top. Only 20 A7Vs were ever made, and only one is still around today, captured by New Zealand and put in the Australian War Museum. Um, now, before I get into this, the scales and stats of the Mark IV, I want to say why... I mentioned the ASMV because it fought in the, I believe, either it or the Mark V um, fought in the first ever tank on tank battle in history. The British came out on top, and I want to explain the battle. Basically, there were two, uh, there were three British tanks. Two of them were female, one of them was male. What fa male and female meant back then was female tanks only had machine guns. And male tanks would have machine guns plus six, usually six pounders, which were very devastating guns at the time. One of the best guns to be putting on a tank. And they were approaching three Strumpanzewagen. And, uh, basically, three Strumpanzewagens were uh, coming up these three Mark IVs, um, or Mark Fives. But the females had to back off. The male was just left there alone. And uh, the right gun, the left gunner had actually died the day before in a battle. And they were just trying to get out. And basically, they kept, the tanks kept charging at each other at very slow rates because. The Stunnenpanzerwagen can only go 8 miles an hour, and the Mark IV could go, like, 3.7 miles an hour. It was not very fast. But, uh, the, uh, the driver made a risky move stopping the tank so the gunner could point straight. He hit the front of the Stunnenpanzerwagen, it bounced off. 
Then he hit the top part that sticks out on the top where the drivers would be, and took it out, and the tank, and the first tank was immobilized, and then they shot under it, where all they have is just this little plate protecting the gas tank, and it's not going to help. It, burnt, it bounced right through the plate, gas, the tank went up in flames, and it flipped on its side. The other two Sturmpanzerwagens backed off. And literally, it said that the right gunner waved his gun back and forth, saying, like, come at me, bro. It's pretty funny. On a scale of 1 to 20, the armor ranks in at a 15. And now if, the ar now, if the stats seem high, it's because I'm rating them off of the tanks at the time. And the Mark IV was a great tank for its time. Armor was 15. Armament, 16. Mobility, 5, because it was slow. Mass production, 8 because it was not easy to make a tank back then, and fear factor was 20, because when these things entered service, no one had a tank, and so they had a reason to be fear. Well, that is number f 4, the Mark IV heavy tank. Uh, now, next is not going to be number 3, I'm actually going to list honorable mentions next. Basically, tanks that were good enough to be on this list, but didn't make it. So, uh, here are the honorable mentions, and the Renault FT-17 was the first tank to use the modern-day concept of a tank, with the treads on the bottom, the engine in the back, and crew compartment in the front, with a turret on top of the crew compartment housing its main armament. Um... The Matilda II earned the name the Mighty Matilda for the 37mm anti-tank gun that the Germans used could not penetrate the armor of this thing. And it and for the first few years of World War II, it was definitely something to be feared. Uh the Comet Cruiser Tank. And like I said when I was talking about the Centurion, the Comet Cruiser Tank was the first was the last cruiser tank they made in World War II, and it was perhaps the best. Being decently fast, had a great gun, and was hard to penetrate its armor. It was good, but the Centurion was better, and, and so it deserved the spot on that list. The M48 Patton. A medium tank that the Americans developed before the Cold War started. For the first few years of its service, it was a great tank. And it was so great that the Israelis took it and made their own version of it called the Magos. Hope I pronounced that right. I'm just... can't pronounce anything right, but... Uh, the M41 Walker Bulldog was the main light tank that America used in the Cold War, and this thing, and this Bulldog had some ferocious teeth, and it was definitely a tough customer. But it wasn't tough enough to make it on the list, and it was only a light tank. The Challenger 1. Uh, this came around the late Cold War and was based off the Chief Chin, and I'm not going to go any further than that because you already heard it when I talked about the Challenger 2. Challenger 1 is just as good as the is almost just as good as Challenger 2, but Challenger 2 had upgraded systems and was a little bit better in performing combat. But the Challenger 1 was still good enough to be mentioned in our honorable mentions. And the, our last honorable mention would be the Leclerc. It is the modern-day tank of France. It is what France France uses as their main battle tank today. Uh, it was originally meant to replace the AMX-30, which uh, there have been many attempts to replace it. The AMX-32 and the AMX-40 tried to replace the AMX-30, but evidently flopped. And the AMX-30 had been in service uh, AMX-30 had been serviced since the Cold War, and it was about time they replaced it, and so they also wanted to do something very interesting, and I really like the Leclerc. I think it could have been on this list, but it wasn't. Uh, they wanted to limit as the crew as much as possible. Most tanks nowadays have four crew members, but this one only had three, because they actually had an automatic loading arm for its main armament and remote-controlled machine guns. So you only had three people, a gunner, a commander, and a driver, and that's all you needed for this tank. And it was 
and it's very good to be able to limit the amount of people you have in a tank. And I have to say, it looks pretty cool too. But that's the honorable mentions. Now let's get on to our top three. Number three is the Panzer VI Tiger, or its long name, the Panzer Kapvogen VI Tiger. One, but hey. The Panzer Kapvogen VI, otherwise known as the Tiger, was put in the service bef was put in the service in 1942 before the the Panzer V Panther was put in the service in 1944. It's a little weird for that reason, but I'll discuss that right now. The reason is. It was a gift given to Hitler on his birthday. Literally, the Panther was in development, and it was the Panzer V, and the Panzer VI, um, they decided to make as a gift for Adolf Hitler on his birthday. And so they just literally threw together a tank and called it the Panzer VI, the Tiger. And, uh... They did design it, but it was pretty much almost thrown together. Uh, uh, now, with the Tiger rushed into service and the Panther is still in development, you would think the Panther would be a better tank. Don't you agree? You would think it seems logical. If something's in development much longer than our thing, it should be better. Not in this case, though. Well, no... It's the other way around. Sorry if that seemed like it was taken out of context. I'm reading a script that I wrote. and uh, But the Tiger was the superior tank. The problem with the Panther was its gear system was meant for a lighter vehicle, meaning it couldn't go full speed, which stinks. Uh, later versions did upgrade the gear system, but when it first came out, it the ge they could not go its full speed because the gear system was meant for a lighter vehicle, so it just the gear system would just snap in half or something like that. Um, the Tiger, on the other hand, had better had a better gear system and could go full speed. But what made it number three on this list is that it is super hard to knock out. Seriously. For the first few months of its service, there were no anti-tank weapons that could destroy this monster. Literally, nothing could kill the Tiger tank in the first few months of its service. Nothing. That, that had to be some feared. Later on, better anti-tank weapons were developed, but the Tiger would continue to serve until 1944 when the Panther and the King Tiger... Uh, w were put into service, which the King Tiger, I'm going to say right now, was an upgraded version of Tiger and was meant to be the ultimate super tank, but it entered service too late in the war, and by before they knew it, the, Ger the Nazis had lost the war, and not too many uh, King Tigers were made, but the King Tigers did definitely serve in combat, and they were definitely uh, a tough nut to crack. But, I want to actually tell you a pretty funny story uh, from a show Caleb wants to watch. I'm not going to say any names of shows, because I really don't want to have to deal with having this video taken off YouTube. So, because I worked very hard to do this. But, the thing was... There was this crew of a king tiger that stopped in a town that was pretty much abandoned because uh, the town, because pretty much there was a battle going on at the town, and so they just stopped at this one building or house and just slept there for the night because no one was there, and and the uh, I believe it was the gunner who uh, woke up hearing a Sherman drive by and the Sherman stopped looking at the tiger the king tiger but the and what the guy did was uh, a little risky basically the crew of the uh, 
the crew of the Sherman got out and looked all around inside the King Tiger and they got inside and looked around and saw no one was there and they got off and just as they got out he the gunner jumps in and gets into the driver's spot or wait I think he was a driver but he got into the driver position and then started driving off and the Panzer crew was creeped out I mean the Sherman crew was creep was creeped out because they saw that no one was in there it's a ghost tank it's a ghost tank wait no it's a ghost tank yeah I didn't mean for the German accent and but the but then another Sherman came around and actually um, shot at it and knocked the gun to where the gun was just pointing down and the gun was blocking the driver's view and so it was hard to see and he dr he was driving back up uh, to his to two other King Tigers that were in front of him but they thought they saw the gun was pointing down and thought that the, the King Tiger had been captured they shoot at it and take out and take out the tank so it's immobilized but the driver still lived to actually tell the story uh, on the show uh, but yeah I just wanted to mention that story so uh, I could talk a little bit about the King Tiger because it was definitely a good tank it just came too late but the the King the Tiger the Tiger one though it was definitely a great tank and deserved number three. And now, finally, we're going to get on to the scales. On a scale of 1 to 20, the armor, 18. Armament, 17. Mobility, 13. Mass production, 9. And fear factor, 18. It has some pretty high stats. Mass production is the lowest, but as we get on, these stats are going to get higher and higher. And, uh, but that's pretty much everything to say about the Panzer, the Panzer VI Tiger. Now, uh, let's move on to number two. Okay, so, we just got done doing number three, the Tiger Tank, and also mentioned the King Tiger and the Panther with that, but now, we're going to take a look at number two, which is the M1A2 Abrams. You know it was coming, but a lot of you might think that the Abrams should have been should be number one, but number one spot belongs to something that's not like the tank was so powerful and unstoppable. It's more of something that it had a large impact. It was just such a revolutionary tank and had a large impact on history. Uh, but we're we're talking about number two right now, the Abrams. So. The M1 Abram, the M1 Abrams was introduced in 1918 in the late Cold War, and right off the bat, the tank was great, but there were, but there was much to be desired. So in 1994, the U.S. developed the M1 A1 Abrams with upgraded systems, and a year later, and a year later in 1995, the M1 A2 Abrams hit the scene using new anti-explosive pads. It equipped on the sides of the tank called Tusk, which I'm pretty sure Matt, I'm going to have Matthew like show a picture of the Abrams with Tusk, and you can just see these little pads on the side of the tank right above the, t right above the treads, and those are Tusk. Basically, what Tusk do is once, once, uh, it's meant to fight against uh, rocket-propelled grenades and explosives like that, rocket launchers, small ones at least. Once it hits the pads, instead of the explosion going everywhere, it explodes outwards, away from the tank. And also, I have to say, the Abrams is very hard, is very tough. I mean, I have seen a video where they literally put a mine under this thing and it explodes, and the Abrams just jumps up a little, but it's okay. Shoot rockets at it. They they shoot at the thing. The thing will not. The thing does not go down. I mean, it's a it's it's a great tank. I mean, America. I, I, one word to describe that tank: America. 
Enough about that, though. The Abrams is one of the fastest tanks on the modern battlefield, with a top speed of 45 miles an hour, which is fast for a tank, especially a tank that he packing that heavy of firepower and so hard to knock out. That's very fast. The armor on the Abrams w is mostly classified, but we do know it is a, at least a foot thick. But I, I don't exactly know if it's actually a foot thick, but I think it's like a little thinner than a foot, but all the stuff that it's made of kind of makes it seem like it's a foot thick. So, and it and it's composed of steel, titanium, Kevlar, and depleted uranium, which is super strong, BTW. That means, by the way... <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I can use text language. I'm not old school. Well, I'm 14, of course I'm not. <laughs> it's only... I was born in, like, the early 2000s. But, yeah, if... That's actually a lot of strong materials put into one. Steel, Kevlar, steel, which, unless you live under a rock, you probably know what steel is. And I mean, there has to be some rock that you're living under if you don't know what steel is. Kevlar is basically a bulletproof fabric, but it's more, but actually the thing that's actually stopping the bullet is a special plastic inside of it. Um, titanium, you probably know what it is. You probably know what titanium is. It's a very strong element, stronger than steel. I don't know how much of it's in it, though, is in the armor. And depleted uranium, you probably haven't heard of this. Depleted uranium is basically uranium with all the, uh, radio, with all the radioactive energy sucked out of it to where you're just left with a very hard metal. This thing is almost as hard as diamond. So, uh, but, and so it's very tough. I mean, they really thought about designing this thing, I'll tell you that. The Abrams mounted a 120 millimeter gun with, an, with, an, with the ammo housed in the back of the turret and a sliding door a sliding door separating the crew from the ammo. Oh, I, I meant to say and there, but I, I swear I read over the script and corrected it, but no one's perfect. But basically, uh, the turret was housed in the... the ammo was housed in the back of the turret like most tanks, but it actually had a sliding door to uh, separate it from the crew, so if the ammo was hit, wouldn't really hurt the crew. And another thing, if the crew, if the crew, oh wait, um, if the ammo was ever hit in battle, a hatch on top of the turret would let the explosion out so the crew could live to fight another day. Basically, this little hatch, if the ammo ever catches fire and explodes, the explosion would go up out of the tank and not in and not just explode inside the tank which is a very genius thing because I think like the the ammo compartment was like the most the most non well shielded or non well protected place but um the Abrams sounds like a sounds like the perfect tank and in a way it is but it's too perfect. Say the U.S. was to go to war with another country. Um, they can't mass produce it for it is so complex. Basically, there's so much stuff that goes into it. It's like the latest technology and all this high-tech stuff to make it the perfect tank. It's so perfect they really don't have the ability to mass produce it because um, it is so complex it's very hard to make the Abrams but still we haven't gone to war yet and let's hope that it doesn't happen at least in my lifetime because uh, I'm concerned for Matthew because he got uh, I don't never mind I'm not gonna mention uh, 
Matthew just doesn't want to be in the military. Ugh. And so, we're trying not to start any wars, but hey, with the government like this, anything could happen. <laughs> okay, but still, the, M the M1 Abrams, ever since it entered service in 1980, has been known as the best tank on the modern battlefield. On a scale of 1 to 20, yeah, I'm getting right into the scales. Um, on a scale of 1 to 20, the armor ranks in at 20, because, you know, I told you, barely anything can penetrate this thing. Um, armament, 18. Mobility, 20, because it's very good. Mass production, 6. It's very low because it was very hard to make this thing and fear factor 17 we have some very high stats here but yeah that's pretty much all there is to say about the m1 abrams we're almost to our number one spot all we gotta do is make it through our counting down our um orig our other nine that we just mentioned so just in case you have short-term memory loss and forget um Number 10 was the M4 Sherman. Probably the most widely used American tank of World War II. For so easy to mass produce, and there were just a lot of them. The Merkiva. Number, uh, number 9, the Israeli Merkiva. The safe, dubbed the name the safest tank in the world. And it's true. And it's just what Israel needed. Um, number 8, the T-5455, a better version of the Sher- the, just, well, just like the Sherman, easy to mass produce, but up, but pretty much was upgraded. Um, number 7, the Challenger 2, taking everything about the Challenger 2, about the Challenger 1, and upgrading its systems, making it better at performing combat. N number 6, the Panzer IV. It was the first tank to ever have a radio installed in it, and was definitely a tank to be feared when first put into service. Number five, the Centurion. The best British cruiser tank that ever entered service, and it definitely did prove its worth with Israel. Number four, the Mark IV heavy tank. The best, the most widely used tank of World War I, and one of the most inspirational. Number three, the, the Panzer VI Tiger I. Almost not for the first few months of its service, almost no anti there were no anti tank weapons that could destroy it, and it was given to Hitler on his birthday. Happy birthday! Whatever. Um, and number two, the M one A two Abrams. The best tank on the modern battlefield and nearly indestructible. It's time. The number one spot, the, the number one tank of all time belongs to the T-34 slash 76A. Surprise? Mm, I don't know. Have you ever heard of it? Well, we're about to discuss the T-34 slash 76A, it's kind of a mouthful if you keep saying it, but it looks like a tank that doesn't belong on this list. But let me tell you, if you said that, then you are wrong. The T-34 had, had to take on tanks that had better armor and armament, and it won. It had a bigger impact on on world, on the history of tanks, the history of war, and the history of the world. It had a bigger impact than any other tank on history, than any other tank in the world. This, it's just so inspirational and was such a big thing. The T-34 76A had a small turret mounting a 76.2 millimeter gun and was good, but the T-34 85 had a larger turret mounting a 85 millimeter gun was even better, 
The T-34 was so fast, strong, could take a hit, and easy to, easy to make, and was feared by the Germans. And was feared by the Germans. Uh, it was had pretty much everything you could ever want in a tank. It is now outdated, and the Abrams could beat it, but it's just its impact on everything else. And I have to say that this probably could be like the grandfather of the Abrams or something like that. Or great-grandfather, even. The German heavy... The German heavy tanks could be fast on ground, but not on ice or mud. Which was true, it was... It was very hard to be fast on mud or ice, uh, even with tanks of World War II, which... Um... Um, the T-34, however, could take them on with ease. Pretty much just gliding over ice or mud like it was no one's business, pretty much. Um, the T-34 was so great, it was, it would continue to be used until the 1990s. The Russians' idea of slope, the Russian idea of sloped armor was used along with many other things that that put itself on the top that put itself on top of the ta of the tanks of it of the time that seemed superior to it I don't know. that was a long sentence I wrote but basically sloped armor was a Russian idea basically say you got like what 50 millimeters of armor here it's taken it straight on it's pretty easy to get through why she sloped it well, if you sloped it, then putting it at an angle, it almost makes it seem like you have to get through twice as much if it's coming straight at you. It's going to have to almost get through twice as much, making 50 millimeters actually be 100 millimeters. And, you've, and everyone used that. If you can see, the Tiger, the King Tiger used sloped armor. And pretty much every other tank after, after this pretty much used that because it was so in inspirational inspired many tanks and even for everything the T-34 has done has made it the best tank of all time the T-34 and that is right the T-34 has made it so far made it so far and it was just a um, it's just one of those things that seems so tiny, but is so mighty. Yes, I just rhymed there. And the T-34-85 was even better. Because it had a larger gun, larger turret, but was pretty much the same thing. And the Germans were definitely feared. We definitely feared these things. But the Germans could have beaten the Russians if Adolf Hitler hadn't taken over military control. Because... And actually, there was something I learned that there was actually a plan to a, for a sniper to assassinate Adolf Hitler. And he almost did it. But he actually had patience. Everyone wanted Adolf Hitler dead, but this sniper had patience. And, and if you're a sniper, that's what you need. Patience. And he thought, I should let, Ad I should let Adolf Hitler live. Because... If I let him live, he could lead to the downfall of Germany, because Germany was already going <clears throat> all the way into the ground because he was taking control of military operations, and it wasn't working. <coughs> um, so... Ah... Uh, but frankly, some people would have said it would have been... Some people would agree with that. Some people won't. Some people would say, just shoot Adolf Hitler. It would have been better. Well, we still made it through World War II, and Adolf Hitler is long gone. He's not here, is he? <coughs> uh, yeah, don't take a picture, camera. It, the one thing I don't like about this camera is if you smile, no matter what. If you smile while playing the video, it, it just takes a picture. It's just so redundant. But whatever. The T-34 was a great tank, and it deserved this spot. It worked through all the hard, 
Grumman. I can't remember the saying, but uh, it worked through all the hard grime just to get to this. And so, on a scale of 1 to 20, the armor, 17, because even though it had thin armor, it was sloped and so it made it harder to get through. The armament was a 19, because an 85mm gun was very good to match up some of the German tanks at the time. Mobility was 20, because it was very fast, since it didn't have a whole lot of armor. It was just sloped, so it was hard to get through. Mass production was 18. Is 18, because... It, once again, used the iconic idea that the Sherman had, uh, m making it easy to mass-produce. And Fear Factor was 19, because the Germans had a reason to fear this thing, for it could it was one of the many things that evidently led to Germany's downfall. Well, thank you for watching this video. Please leave a like and a comment, and don't forget to subscribe subscribe if you haven't already and uh, I would like uh, anyone to comment if anyone if you watch this video and you have an idea on a top 10 you would like me to do it can be the top 10 can be about any subject I don't care as long as um, I th as long as I like the subject and I won't do weird things okay because I'll and if I get no suggestions, I already have my own ideas for some more top tens, and I'm hoping to start a new top ten series on Phantom Studios. Um, but yeah, pretty much. But yeah, pretty much that's uh, all I had to say. Please uh, suggest any ideas for more top tens in the comments below. And, uh, uh, this is Jeremy from Phantom Studios, and, uh, thank you for watching this, thank you for watching this video, and, uh, you can go on with the rest of your day. I got nothing else to say. Goodbye.